Good morning, everybody. Um, Starting with some housekeeping. We are going to do a Q&A 45 minutes in, but I will also have questions that pop up on this screen. If you have something you want to ask Will Roper, type it in on Slido. Your direction should be somewhere. Um, and then they will appear on my screen, and then I will ask Dr. Roper. This is Will Roper. He possibly has the best job in the world. He gets to help design the future of warfare. He has 50 people and a budget of a billion dollars. Um, and. Not a lot of people know who he is. So um, last night I was having dinner with a friend um, who's a deputy assistant secretary of defense. I was like, hey, what should I ask Will Roper? Because who the hell is Will Roper? I was like, well, he runs SCO. What the hell is SCO? So this is a deputy assistant secretary of defense who doesn't know about this apartment in the Department of Defense. So Will Roper, good morning. Good morning. What the hell is SCO? And if it's secret, what the hell are you doing at South by Southwest <laughs> in front of all these people? <laughs> What a long, long, strange trip it's been, uh, Nick. Um, I do have one of the best jobs in the Pentagon, you know, full period, full stop. And, and you've got it exactly right. Our job in SCO is to help, help our military get ready for tomorrow's war. Now, note, I don't say the future's war, something that's, that's 20 or 30 years down the road. I just can't see that that far ahead. And I doubt many of you would believe any prediction about what the future is going to be 20 years from now. I mean, think about how different our lives are today based on where they were 20 years ago before, before the year 2000. Fundamentally different, we're, we're so much more interconnected. Who would have foreseen the smartphone revolution? And so I think the, the Pentagon's widely said, wisely said, let's focus on tomorrow and let's figure out a way to fight differently. Because the issue we have, Nick, is we, we're a great military, still the greatest military in the world, the only military that can pick up and fight a war anywhere around the world. But we've been doing warfare the same way for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine if you're a, an adversary of the US, you've been watching, been watching us, you've been taking notes, probably copying the things that you like, and trying to exploit the things where you think you could get an advantage. And so our job is to basically try to change the game, try to take the things that the world's familiar with. So ships, aircraft, submarines, satellites, the bread and butter of how we project power, and to find new ways to use them so that if a conflict were to occur on day one, day two, day three, the way we fight is fundamentally different than the way the world's seen in, in the Gulf Wars. So that sounds pretty easy. So what you do is you take the slowest, most sclerotic bureaucracy in the world and you change the way it does everything quickly. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why we were created as a separate entity is that it's, it's hard to change the Pentagon overnight. Uh, it's still an apparatus that builds things the way we did in the Cold War where, where systems came out about every 10 years. And I'm not knocking the process, right? It did win the Cold War for us, so thumbs up for that. But this is not the Cold War era world we live in. Technology moves fundamentally faster. And so the Pentagon needed a new organization to see can we move at the pace of, of industry technology? Can we spiral out capabilities on a two, three, four year basis? And then we also had to test the hypothesis can we make our military do new for different things? Can we make ships and subs and tanks do different things? Or are they so rigid that they're not able to, to be turned 90 degrees out of phase? So the reason that we were such a, a, a classified entity for so long, which is why not a lot of people in the department know about us, is what if the answer to those questions had been no? No, we can't move at the pace of commercial technology. No, we can't make our systems do different things then we would not have wanted the world to know that we're basically stuck with what we have and the way that we use it. But the reason that the previous Secretary of Defense brought us out from behind the door, and you know, we went from being uh, men in black to, to, to men in gray, is that we found that our military systems can do amazing new things. And so it's time to start telling the world about some of them because we don't wanna just get ready to fight tomorrow's war, though we need to be able to do that. We wanna be able to deter tomorrow's war and if you don't tell the world what your changes are, at least give them a hint of them, then there's not going to be any deterrent in the mind of your, of your opponents. So we're showing a little bit of what we're doing, but we're still keeping our best capabilities uh, locked away tight for a rainy day. All right, well, let's start the interview with your public not best capabilities. And when we get to the end, you can tell me all about your private best capabilities. So. Um, <laughs> first thing that people are maybe a little bit familiar with are your drone swarms. Mm -hmm. So you invented these scariest sounding things I've ever heard, like even watching on TV makes you feel like you're in birds. Mm -hmm. What are these drone swarms? 
how did you do it, why do you do it, and what's going to happen with them? Yeah, it's a really cool program. So if you're interested in seeing it, uh, 60 Minutes did a great job of, of covering it, and they've got their, their piece online. So what it is, is it's a, it's a micro UAV where all of the software inside of it is built with an open architecture, government-owned autopilot, and this really cool capability to let the UAVs work together as a team. So there, there's no leader in the team. The mission is the leader. And so all of the UAVs talk to each other. They sort out what's going to be their role in the team, and, and then they get on with doing it. And the application that we demonstrated a few, uh, a few months ago is packing over 100 of these into our, uh, our fighter airplanes. So that's a very difficult environment to come out of. You're flying at you know, near the speed of sound. It's cold on the airplane. You've got vibration and shock. So this is a tough thing to make a UAV survive in. But we kicked 100 of these out in the desert, and they formed a swarm, and they went out and, and did surveillance over a large area. And so, and did really well. So we were doing things like killing UAVs, like pulling them out of the swarm and showing that it would self-heal, that the other UAVs would recognize, oh, I just lost some brothers and sisters and we need to change what we're doing to cover the gap. And then we would let them rejoin and show that, oh, we found new, new participants. We should change what we're doing to take advantage of them. So really, really fascinating technology that we applied to this surveillance mission. But what we're really trying to see is could we take commercial technology Every piece of our drone you can go buy commercially. So if you want to go build a Perdix UAV, that's what we call it, Perdix, you can go do it. But you would be hard pressed to replicate the software that we put in it. So that's advantageous because you're using it to surveil ISIS and 10 of them fall down or are shot down, ISIS picks them up. They're not going to get anything because it's just generic plastic. Commercial technology, the software is easy to protect. And so if you think about what we did, we took a fighter Fighter is a fast thing, right? It, it, it wants to fly fast and, and you know, shoot weapons, and it's, it's well optimized for that. What it's not optimized to do is to try to find low-lying targets on the ground. We, we have other aircraft like, like Reapers and Predators that do that. But, but what if there's a fighter that's, that's out you know, by itself or, or in a squadron, and it needs to find something on the ground, but there's not a Reaper or Predator available? Well, in the past, you were just out of luck. But now you can take that effective capability on board, and if you happen to be called upon to do it, mm -hmm. you've got low-lying surveillance at the push of a button. And if you don't have to do it, well, then land and save it for a rainy day. So it blurs the domain between those two types of aircraft. Now the thing that, that did one job is able to do, to do both. And let's talk a little bit. I don't want to get too deep into this because it's endlessly complex, but you build this. And the services, the, force, the services are both your clients, they're your bosses, and they're also kind of your adversaries, right? Because you start getting credit for all the innovations, they're not getting credit for the innovation. So how do you navigate getting these drones out there? Yeah, it's, it's been a big learning uh, curve for me, Nick, is trying to figure out how do you make things move quickly through through the Pentagon, it's, you'd, you'd, be, you'd find it easier to push a wet noodle than it is to push something quickly through the <laughs> Pentagon. It is nearly impossible. The thing we got right is we became, we became a strategic partner with the services. Um, we, we could never, ever put micro UAVs in, a, in an Air Force fighter or a Navy fighter. We could never repurpose Navy weapons. We could never team unmanned systems with manned systems for the Army if the Army, Navy, Air Force weren't for it. So here, here's something we haven't done a great job in the Pentagon talking about. Our, our technology base is very strong. The department does technology well. So, so the DARPAs and the Air Force Research Labs and the Navy Research Labs all of the things that do science and technology do a great job of taking something from science possibility to science fact, something that's ready for, for potential military application. But what science and technology groups don't do is they don't do, well, what's the war fighting context? How do I go fight with it? How do I make a difference on the battlefield? The services think more about that. Well, the services need to know that war fighting context, which is a higher burden of proof than the scientific uh, community gets to. And so all we've done is build a bridge from the science world to the warfighting world. And what we do in SCO is we take a bet. We, we have money that helps. You can't do anything without money. We'll bet on one of those services technologies for a specific application. Love these drones. Let's go make them do a swarm to do surveillance. Love your missile defense interceptor Navy. Let's go make it sink a ship. 
And we don't ask the service to pay money, we just ask them to be under the tent of interest. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that when you come in to a service that's used to getting things on a 10-year basis, right. and you give them something in three, that maybe is not a platinum, uh, you know, a platinum medal winner, but it's a solid gold medal winner, that gold medal today is better than platinum tomorrow. And so I think we've got the, the process right. As long as we stay a good partner, I think we'll continue to build speed and, and, and grow as an organization. I, now I understand it, right? Because when somebody comes to Wired and is like, I've got $500 million and I'd like to do something for you, I say yes. <laughs> That's right. Why would you tell me no, right? <laughs> Especially if it makes your job easier, better, and cooler. <laughs> All right, let's talk I, a little bit more about what you do. Let's talk about um, how you're going to integrate Pokemon Go into the, uh, into the Army. <laughs> yeah. Very easy to see that question coming, Nick. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, generally, I am fascinated with the video game world. And I, I, I want to I find a way to use it for, for, for military purposes, just so I can say when I'm playing video games that I'm doing research. If I can get there, <laughs> I think everything changes with my wife at home. And uh, I'm sorry, honey, it's the future of our country depends on this. Uh, I think the department, and this is not just true for the video game industry, I think it's true for a lot of the industries that, that are growing up in this increasingly digital economy uh, that we live in. Uh, we have not changed our game to recognize the power and potency of what they're developing. So Pokemon Go is an example of a broader, a broader thing the video game uh, industry is solving, which is called a game, so the Pentagon views it as sort of a cutesy thing in a, in, a, in a world that we don't work with. I view that they've solved one of the toughest challenges for warfare uh, that's foreseeable in this century, which is how do you take amazingly complex information and make it so, so integrated with the person who's interacting with it that people sitting around the world can act as integrated teams even though they're not together. And I think, I think that is going to be how future warfare plays out. It's going to be complicated. We're going to have analytics and artificial intelligence trying to sift through the data. We're going to have to display it in front of operators in a way that they understand that's intuitive, that they don't have to be a PhD in it to, to use, and they don't have to read a training manual that's 1,000 pages thick. And that allows them to operate with people that may not be right next to them, but towards a common purpose. And if the Pentagon tried to build that capability, we probably would take us 10 years to do it, and it would look like a 1990s Atari game when we're done. So there are kind of two levels then, actually, to the answer to the Pokemon Go thing. One, you're trying to figure out interfaces, right? So how you put real world things, virtual, combined virtual worlds and real world things. And then also this whole problem of collaboration that the video game folks have yes. solved. So take Pokemon Go. There's a case of, uh, of augmented reality, which is probably uh, a good place to begin, because we don't, we don't want to have operators quit using their senses, right? We're highly, highly evolved to sense this world. We don't want to throw that away anytime soon. But you could imagine that, that if you had different, different squads that were fighting a land war, and they're, and they're being, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing things differently, they're finding different enemy targets or different friendly targets, uh, that it would be great if they could drop an icon the way you can in a video game and then everyone sees it. It'd be great if you knew there was a bad guy behind the wall uh, to be able to, to let someone else know and let them see that kind of invisible figure behind the way a video game does. Uh, and the thing that I love about video games is they've made it intuitive. The, the user interface is high on the list of what they value, and it's not something that, uh, that the department's been historically good at, making things that you can use out of the box with no training manual. So what we're exploring, we're exploring with the Army, we're exploring with the Marine Corps, and also with our special operating forces, is what's the first step? I don't want to make what they're seeing so complicated that, that, it, that it detracts, it distracts from what their senses have been trained to do. Like a lot of money goes into training them to be the best they can be, and they are. But I gotta guess if I did simple things, like let them drop a marker, give them a mini-map, the way a first-person shooter has one that gives you a small global view at, at, you know, at the lower right-hand corner so that you know where things are happening on a global scale while you're focusing on what's immediately ahead, but that would immediately up the game of performance. So that's a, a very active area uh, for us this year. So there's, you know, this funny thing has happened in sports, right, where like NFL players train on Madden, right, and baseball mm -hmm. players train. It's become, the simulations have become so realistic. Do you see a future where soldiers are like training on Halo? 
Yeah, I think you know, games like Halo, Call of Duty were, were made. So, so to get into the Marines, I'm not going to have to run, you know, a 60 minute mile. I'm going to have to like, you know, do well at Halo. Yeah, it's. I'm, I'm not. I'm not willing to take the step today to say that in, in future we'll be a, an Army or Marine Corps of gamers. But what I what I do know is this: games right now are made to emulate warfare as best they can and give people that tactile uh, feeling of control. I would not be surprised if eventually the chicken and egg cycle completes where we start making warfare more like games because if you've ever watched people play, play video games, high level of proficiency that people develop and not just in controlling their own local character. I mean, many games explore the idea of one person controlling multiple things. That's, that's one of the big thrusts that you see across all areas for us in the Strategic Capabilities Office. We love taking a, a manned system, uh, you know, some, something that's got a, a person in it, and operators in it, and, and allowing it to transcend being a single thing to being a team of things, where the manned system can control a lot of unmanned things. And so, well, how are we gonna let them do that control? I think the video game industry gives us a lot of insights on how to do it. And the power of, of letting single systems become teams is obvious. If you've, got, if you've got people in it, it's probably expensive. You probably have to get it home, right? You don't wanna send people into harm's way. But what if the, the leading edge of war were, were systems being controlled by those people, but a step back from the front lines? So that the dangerous jobs, the boring jobs, having to go out and do surveillance for a long period of time, we, we, we delegate those to machines, but in a way that people can control and that's intuitive, without making it busy, busy work for them. So I, we see that kind of model being a staple of the future of warfare, that, that what was once a single thing will almost always become a team of things where most of the members of the team are expendable autonomous systems. So, okay, so this gets to one of the sort of the central existential questions that somebody like you has to deal with, which is, you know, we used to have warfare where it was humans were flying the planes, humans were doing everything. Now we're getting to have warfare where humans are kind of behind. And right, as we know with drones, once you take humans and you make the, you don't have to worry about the plane getting shot down because there's not a human and it, it changes the way you fight, right? So as you think through the next five, 10 years of warfare, as we become more autonomous at every level, how does the relationship between the humans and the machines change? What do the humans do? What do the machines do? And what do you worry about? Yeah, I think the autonomy is going to be one of the things that truly does change how we think about warfare. The, the drone, as, as we think of it today, so some kind of remotely piloted vehicle, the vehicle doesn't have people in it, but there is a pilot someplace that is giving it its commands to fly. That's not a new idea. It might, might shock you that the first time that a drone was flown in combat, to my knowledge, is in World War II. So the U.S. in that war needed to destroy the, the Nazis' V3 super gun, which was in a very hardened bunker in France. And so the idea that we had, and amazingly, this amazing generation did this in about six months. They took emerging television technology, so iconoscope television, they strapped it to the front of a heavy bomber, filled it with a bunch of explosives, put radio control uh, equipment on it, and flew a bomber right behind it. So there's a pilot and the bomber in the rear flying the drone in front. That was done in World War II. And all you're seeing now is that good idea, which is it helps to have a plane that can do things that doesn't have people in it. Sensible, right? Yeah, it's, it can be in a, on an expendable mission. That idea has now just grown into the kind of drone warfare that we've seen in, in the Middle East. What's different is that now we can start creating drones where we delegate the ability to make choices at some level. So in the case of the Perdix swarm coming out of the fighters, we delegate the ability for them to determine how they want to do surveillance, mm -hmm. but we don't delegate what mission they're doing. The human controls that. I think this quarterbacking idea is gonna be one of the big things that we're gonna to have to sort out. How do we make a person an effective quarterback of a team of things that are truly autonomous, that are not being remotely piloted, that are doing their own thing, but under certain restrictions. And I'm confident we do not want to delegate everything to the machine. We're not, we're not smart enough to build those. We're not, we're not capable of building something that can make decisions like a person. But at the same time, I don't want to have pilots with 100 joysticks in their cockpit trying to fly all these little planes either. There's a balance between the two. 
And so I, 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 quarterbacking is a term I use. I'm, I don't, don't know exactly how it's going to be on the battlefield, but I could imagine an operator sending out these autonomous units. There's a play that they're going to run, just like a football team would run, would run plays. And that, depending on what the team members say back to the quarterback, the quarterback runs the play as called or calls an audible the way uh, that uh, an Omaha, the way Peyton right. Manning would. And, and then there's a different play that's run. But the quarterback always knows the play. So my gut tells me it's going to be like that. As a designer and as an engineer, I've got to make it so in the system and be able to prove to the world that they really do have control over it. So your former boss, Ashton Carter, often talked about um, autonomous warfare and said there would always be a human in the loop in any kill decision, right? So if a drone is actually going to shoot something and there's a risk that a human will die, another human will die, a human has to make that call. And he sort of framed that morally. But, but you're saying it's practical, right? Yeah. It's both moral and practical, or it's... No, it's, def it's absolutely a moral issue. Uh, I think I cannot imagine the American way of fighting uh, being what I consider to be a fairly lazy way of fighting, the way, that, the way that ISIS would fight, which is, yeah, I'll just take a drone, I'll just go buy something off the shelf, I'll weaponize it, and the first person who picks it up, it'll blow up. Right? That, that's, not a, that's not a U.S. technology. Anyone, anyone here could do it if they wanted to. Uh, it's just, uh, it would be uh, very disruptive uh, to everyone if you did. But it's no different than, a, than an IED, right? It's just taking that idea a step forward, sort of a, like a fly ED, right? Mm -hmm. It's an IED that's in the air. And uh, I expect that we will start seeing that in future, unfortunately. I think when I view this issue of, of human in the loop, I don't want the American way of fighting to not have that human in the loop, but I also think of it practically as a designer and that having a human in the loop makes my job as a, as a technologist easier. People, you know, we, all of us, brought a processor into this room that's amazing. You, you can understand patterns that a computer will have difficult uh, time doing. You can do risk calculus in a way that it's tough to teach a machine to do. And so we want to use our processors for that higher order thinking. We want to use machines to do the number crunching, brute force, difficult uh, for us to do kind of work. And then, and then the key is, how do, I, how do I balance between those two ends in a way that's effective? And every time I've found that, that if, you, if you leave the basic play calling to the person and the play running to the machine, you're usually at the right design point for, for what technology allows, but what our policies also require. So I want to go back to something you said when you were talking about the American way of fighting and you know, the way we use technology versus the way ISIS would use technology. Everything you invent is going to get to ISIS. You know, it may take a little bit of time, it may take a while, but once we've put something on the battlefield, you know, these small drones will be figured out. The technological advances that you come up with, that you're engineers. So how do you think about that? Do you think, well, wait a second, if I introduce this, this could actually be incredibly damaging as a terrorist weapon, right? So maybe I won't actually push forward on this technology because the next thing, it may be good in the short term, but the next thing will be bad. Yeah, it's, it's something we always think about when we're thinking of an expendable system is that eventually uh, it may be picked up by someone else. And this is the area where we need to do better in the Defense Department of not over-designing things so that we can't lose them. You, we're pretty good at designing exquisite systems in the Pentagon, but exquisite means using the best of government technology. And we probably don't ever want to lose that because you know, we've got time and effort in it. So in the case of our drones and our autonomous minions, we're trying to stay within the space of commercial technology. Does is everything have a commercial part number? Could you go buy it? Could you assemble it yourself? And that's probably not going to be as high performing as something we could build you know, ourselves. But we do that so that if it's left behind on the battlefield, yep, anyone in the world could touch it. Where we put our investment is in the high end of low technology. Mm -hmm. Let's add software that allows the, those systems to collaborate, to function with something like a fighter or a ship or a submarine in a way that uh, you know, a terrorist group could never do. And software is relatively easy to protect. Hardware is, is not. I'm sure you can't either confirm or deny this, but the, you know, the Vault 7 CIA secrets have just been put online. How can, um, in this era, how can we say that software is relatively easy to protect? It's easier to protect than mm -hmm. hardware. So, I mean, software is localized. Uh, lots of companies, uh, aside from the government, are working on better and better ways to protect, to protect data as it runs and data at rest. So, so I see that path of investment and think, if we have to take a bet between protecting hardware or software, software is the right way to go. 
So we put our exquisite technology in software, which by the way, it's really software and data that are changing our world, uh, more so right now than hardware, that we're going the right path. And where we have to use, where we have to use high-end technology, almost always those capabilities, those programs are classified because we, we want to save them for the day one of the war and not have them start becoming the routine way that we, that we conduct operations in a way that might be compromised. So the last two questions I asked you were whether you worry your technology will get to ISIS and whether you worry about hackers. And I want to ask a related follow-up, which is what else keeps you awake at night this is from the audience? Oh, I, there's a lot that keeps me awake. I, I, think, the, I think the Pentagon's um, lack of recognition that that data is going to be one of the primary tools and fuels and weapons in future warfare. We, we don't treat data the same way that a company like Google or Apple or Amazon do. For us, data is kind of like the exhaust that comes out of our system. So you know, we're burning gas and the exhaust comes out and the data comes out and the data is used to make actions there. That's not the way people working machine learning or AI are thinking. They're thinking whoever has the most data is gonna be able to train the most intelligent machine and that machine is gonna have the best advantage. And so the government needs to be, the Pentagon especially, needs to be saving and stockpiling all of its data from every flight, every mission, every exercise, every event needs to be databased in a way that's machine discoverable. And the reason that I fear us not doing it is what if in future we fight a military all of whose systems learn. So day two of the war, they're smarter than day one but we're fighting with systems that don't learn. Well, then we put the burden completely on people to try to make, make whatever they need to do work within a system that's effectively fixed. And I fear us not, not moving down that path quickly. And um, so that's one of our major focuses this year is treating data as a strategic resource. You can, you can tell that Will was a, a former mathematician before he uh, went into the defense department and he studied string theory because data is what keeps him awake at night. Data is what puts me to sleep at night. <laughs> um, so when you talk about data and learning and machine learning, tell me how this would fit into this, um, these autonomous systems, the, um, the kind of the Pokemon Go systems you're building. So the idea would be somebody's fighting in an urban environment. You've developed some kind of screen from studying video games or even working with video game manufacturers and you're taking in every possible bit of information from the outside. You're taking in you know, information about heat, you're taking in information about sound, you're taking in information that we as humans can't recognize, and you're learning on the go and improving day by day in that urban battle? Yeah, and, and the example that you pick up, I, from things as simple as taking all of the intelligence that we have and, and real world information and just being able to put likely sniper locations, or, like, or locations where there are gonna be blind spots, or locations where if you, if you make a right-hand turn down a street, uh, that, 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 it's, that it's a dead end. Very simple things to begin with. The key is gonna be figuring out how to have the complicated analytics uh, that's running in whatever network, whatever cloud-based architecture we're, we're using in future, not having that confuse the operator at the time that they need to be very aware of the real world. But, but this isn't just, isn't just relegated to this Pokemon Go space. Every system in our department should be learning in future. Um, like even worlds that don't get a lot of, a, of attention, like logistics, right? If you ever meet someone from the US military that does logistics, give them a hug, because <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's not the kind of thing that makes the front news of the papers, but if you go back and look at like what allowed uh, you know, great generals like Napoleon to win in history. Oh, time and time again, it's, it's militaries that have great logistics. We have great logisticians who are able to like set up what's effectively a city in Afghanistan and keep fuel and water and ammo and all of that flowing in. Well, could you imagine what would happen if we had all of that logistics data being stored and analyzed uh, through machine learning routines the way that, that many companies like UPS do? we'd find efficiencies. You almost always find 10% efficiency off the top. So it's not just that we might fight better. I think we also have a chance to save money. But this is a culture shift. So this is a tough thing to do, folks, is try to take, try to take a Pentagon that is device-centric, device being like fighter, bomber, submarine, ship, tank, and shift it to being data-centric to merely think of their systems as being data producers and the data being more important than the system itself. But we're gonna have to shift, in my opinion. And is that 
in the purview of your office? I mean, aren't you building sort of specific tools? Isn't the sort of a shift to the Pentagon to a data organization kind of a different thing? Yeah, I've learned you can't, I, and that's, big organizations don't change because you go in and say, we've got to change. I learned that early on. Going around and giving a speech about the future warfare doesn't change anything in the Army, Navy, Air Force. What does are pathfinder activities that are a step in that direction. Because the, the, the future is not going to be made. It's going to be made in a series of tomorrows. So the way we work is we have this future vector, like, oh, I really wish the department were data-centric. Well, I, I can run around like a, you know, like a person on their soapbox saying do that, but until I come in with a step in that direction that's executable, no one's going to do it. And so all across our initiatives, they are strategic steps in directions we think we should go. And those directions are usually, usually three things that I think will be absolutely uh, quintessential to getting warfare right in the future. Uh, the first is things that blur the domains of war. So in future, my, my prediction is land power, air power, sea power, we won't use those terms anymore because armies won't fight armies, navies won't fight navies, air forces won't fight air forces, everyone will fight everyone. And we'll shift to the term air power, land power, sea power, which is just the place that we launch the weapon or the sensor from. And so initiatives like, like you brought up, taking a, a missile defense interceptor and making it an offensive weapon blurs defense and offense. Taking the Army's, uh, Army's missiles are, are meant to destroy armies on land. We're modifying them so that they can sink ships. We just took land warfare to the sea domain. So I can go tell the Army, hey, Army, you need to be able to sink ships. And people have been telling the Army that now for about 10 years. Right. But the Army has now embraced sinking ships because I gave them a cheap, quick way to get there. So that's way one, blur the domains. Way two, we've already talked about it. It's like, let's team stuff together. Let's use autonomy and take things that used to be vulnerable and make them a team of things uh, so that uh, you got the benefit of expendability. So we have versions of this with every service and um, really, really enjoying working with the Air Force on a um, concept called Avatar where fighters have, have small mini drones that, that fly in front of them that can take the leading edge of risk away from the fighter. So now the fighter effectively becomes something different, something, something that's, that has a greater reach, uh, more capabilities than you could put on a single aircraft. So I think you're gonna see teams everywhere, and the final bit's what we've just talked about, is that central to everything is gonna be treating information, the ability to process it, learn from it, react to it as a, as a strategic imperative, and that needs to be through all, all facets of the military. So I have a question from the audience that I hope you can answer with a simple yes, but um, it's from Sinan Klukas. Are you working on genetic modification? If so, do you think you could make a human who could swim as fast as a shark? <laughs> uh, no, we're not, but, 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 if, uh, but if we were, I would sign up to be the first <laughs> person to do that. I'll tell you, uh, biology is an area that I'm doing a lot of reading now. So I'm a, you know, I'm a mathematician and physicist, and so I'm, I'm not a biologist. And biology and genetics are just fascinating now. So if you're not if you're not keeping up with like gene editing, or if it, you know if it's something worth like going and YouTubing a like what is what is CRISPR gene editing? There's some nice tutorials. It's gonna shock you because what's starting to happen in the biological world is 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 something that is always the leading edge of a huge revolution in science, which is when disciplines that were that were disparate collide. And what's starting to happen now in genetics is computer science and biology are colliding. And so we're gonna have to look very carefully at this. Now this is an area that gives me a lot of concern. I, probably, I could have added it to the things that keep me awake at night. Uh, we, we value human life and we should in this country. Com countries that don't have the same values are going to have advantages in being able to experiment with genetics and human modification in a way that we're not. So we're gonna have to work harder, faster, better to stay ahead. And my, I just have to believe in my, in my gut that, that being on the right side of this question is important, but we can't just hope that being on the right side means that nothing bad is gonna happen on the other side. So at a minimum, we're gonna need to understand the benefits and then work harder, better, faster to stay ahead of them. So let me ask you another audience question which ties into this, which is how do you recruit people? I mean, this is something that Ashton Carter talked about a lot, but you know, somebody's great in the video game industry or they're great working with CRISPR, they can make hundreds of thousands of dollars or found a company. Working for you, they become a GS-14 um, and they're inside the Pentagon bureaucracy. So how do, you, how do you bring them in? 
Now, it's, uh, the, the best thing you can do is to get people in quickly, which we do. Uh, so we work hard to hire people fast. Uh, we, you don't have to work through the Pentagon bureaucracy if you work in SCO, so people can be effective day one. Really? Yeah, absolutely. You're not, you, we're effectively. You're just like a rogue unit in the Pentagon, you can hire anybody you want? I'd like to, perf well, I mean, we have to follow government hiring regulations. Give Will Rope your resume, you can work for the Pentagon okay. tomorrow. Yeah. If you're fast, <laughs> then uh, you'll, compete, uh, you'll compete high on the chain. Now, I mean, the, working in the government is kind of like <sighs> living in a Monty Python skit in that sometimes you have these nonsensical things uh, that, that, that simultaneously exist. You can ask lawyers the same question and get yes and no, even sometimes from the same lawyer. And so the, what, what's missing in the Pentagon right now and, and you, you've seen now leadership try to change this, is a sense of daring and doing right, doing right, being right, as opposed to following all the letters of the rules, because the rules are intentionally vague, just like the tax code. And when you talk to the people who made the codes, members of Congress, they want us to go fast. So we basically have a process right now we follow for hiring and building things. And when you go around to the people who touch it, and you go to the combatant commanders who fight the war and say, do you like this process? They say no. When you talk to the services and ask them, do you like this process? They say no. And when you talk to Congress and ask them, do you like this process? They say no. No one likes the process, and yet, and yet everyone seems to be following it. So what I had to get adept at doing is finding the loopholes that are available. And these are loopholes that are not like sneaky going around. These are intentionally there to allow leadership the ability to move fast when it's necessary. And if you look at the challenges that we have around the world, we need to move fast yesterday. And so I don't mind being the person that comes in and says, I have an exception to the rule and I'm going to use it. And if you want to you know, fire me, fine. I'm going to do what's right, as opposed to trying to save my backside with every decision. Well, once you've done that, you can get people in quickly. You can get programs done quickly. You can, you can bypass around the clogs and the arteries. Uh, and as long as you make sure people understand, you have you know, the right people reviewing your processes, you keep Congress informed, it hasn't held us back. I haven't been dragged out on the carpet. People keep trying to give me more money to do things quickly. So I, we need more daring. And so I'm hoping, if anything, our example will encourage other people in the government and other people who come in that when you, when you try to do the right thing for the future of the country, and as long as you're making sure you're not intentionally cutting corners that shouldn't be cut, you're gonna be rewarded when you're fast. Wow, so work for a roper, 50 employees, a billion dollars and no rules. <laughs> um, question from Rohit Tawani. Is the genetically engineered super soldier we've been hearing about so much at the South by Southwest even relevant anymore with all this technology? I think, I mean, that's a great question, whoever asked it. Um, I think there's, the, there's a big question about what genetic modification will do. I mean, we're at the beginning, right, of thinking of First, our... First, explain what the super soldier is. I mean, just being able to, to go in and, and use genetics to make people as nearly as perfect as they can be. So let's give you the best eyesight, the best hearing. You could even imagine giving people traits that, that, they, that they wouldn't have naturally, um, but, but other creatures do, right? so genetic hacking. Um, it's, I think this is going to be a wild west for a while until we determine like how much is genetic coding like writing computer code? You know, can, can we really get the effects that are wanted? And then the ethics of it are going to be a serious debate which should be debated. If we can make people better, faster, stronger, should we and under what circumstances? And the debate's naturally going to be, to be brought up from, from, from the medical community, right? We can take away weaknesses, vulnerabilities, illnesses, cancers that people would have had. But then it's naturally going to come coupled to, well, what happens when you're not actually preventing something that's negative? You're adding something that's positive. And so I think the jury's out if this is easy or hard, but it's certainly not something that we can stick our head in the sand and pretend isn't, isn't something to be thought about. So you did something um, last year um, called the Broad Area Announcement, where you basically said, hey, here I am. Send me your ideas. Um, tell me the kind of things we should build. What did you, um, you got a lot of response. And what, did you, what did you get out of it? What have you built that somebody in this room submitted to you through, uh, through email? Yeah, so one of the things, one of the things that is very important uh, uh, to obey in the government, um, you know, it's important to obey all the rules, but in their minimal interpretation. But, but being able to have competition. So 
there, there's a broad area announcement. That is basically a way you get an idea to the government. So if you go to FezBizOps, which is our government website, and you search for SCO, you'll have a pay, you know, link that pops up. And it's basically where you can submit a one-page set of ideas. Tell me what it is, what would you do with it, why is it valuable? And so, and it's broad, so it's not in any particular area. And so we've had this open now for a while, and we've gotten some great ideas. There's some crazy ideas. I mean, they're just, but, but what we like is that uh, there are some ideas from people who haven't worked with the government before. So I've already mentioned the video game industry. Uh, just because you're in an area that isn't working with us now, maybe you should be. And I think one of the things that's great about working with the government is that we have a lot of, a lot of uh, research and development dollars. Almost 70 billion a year, 70 billion a year. So that's, that's more than most of the top companies in the US combined, that's a ton of money for research. The thing we're gonna have to change, Nick, which you and I have talked about before is most of the technologies that are changing the world change so quickly that the government cannot own. We, we cannot okay. have that relationship we had in the past where we own intellectual property. But that's kind of the old school way people in the, in the Pentagon are trained. Government spends money, government owns the product. And, and I'm trying to explore new ways to work with industry where we never own the product, but maybe we could own a window of time. Mm -hmm. So if we help develop the next step in your algorithm, the next uh, widget in your, in your video game. Can we be your beta tester for six months before the rest of the world so that we're not operating with a system where the zero day exploits are known? All right, well that brings up a very complicated thing in two ways. Number one, in order to do that, you need a very close relationship with these companies, right? With UPS, Amazon, Google, Apple, whoever you're working with. Extremely close relationship, trusting relationship. It has just been revealed, and you can't confirm or deny, that the government has been stockpiling zero-day exploits on all these companies, which has pissed them off. How do you develop a really close relationship with companies while other arms of the government are spying and exploiting them? So I'll, I'll just talk for what we do in SCO, um, and, but I think the models extrap it can be extrapolated. You don't start building a partnership by writing down exactly what you want. You start by looking at where areas of, of mutual interest overlap. And I think for a, a lot of companies, uh, there is a large area of overlap uh, between what we want and what they want. And so even just this area of sorting real news, you know, real news from fake news, which we would call you know, propaganda from, from legitimate information, I, I think everyone shares that common, that, that common interest that we want when we're trying to suck in the world of information to understand real from false. Well, maybe we could work on that together so that there are common ways of doing this. So, you know, if we say this is, this is true, this isn't, everyone sees it the same way. There, that might be an, a, the basis to build a new partnership. So I think we, we're going to have to reset because the way we built partnerships uh, at, after World War II, and, and we had an amazing advantage then that, you know, when the greatest generation, you know, finished World War II, they went to work to, in industry, and industry knew about us because the people yeah. were there who knew the military. But that's changing now. And companies are now here that are very different companies than those that grew at the end of World War II, very, very data-centric, less product-centric. So it's time to reset and try to build a new basis of relationship. And so it's not gonna happen overnight, but once we have those bridges being built, we're going to have to keep them strong and, and treat them as a strategic resource. They are not worth burning for small gains, given that the companies that we would be building them with are truly changing the world around us. That's interesting. Let me ask you a, a moral question, which ties into something of uh, somebody in the audience named Sandra has asked, which is, you know, Robert Oppenheimer, um, great physicist, helped develop the nuclear bomb and spent the rest of his life regretting that he'd done that. Two parts to this. One, if you'd had SCO in 1940, would you have worked on a nuclear bomb? And then part two, today, what, what would you not want to build? Do your first part again, Nick. If you were at SCO in 1940, mm -hmm. and you'd seen um, sort of a framework for building a nuclear a detonation device, you're in Robert Oppenheimer's position, you're in Los Alamos, do you proceed, or do you say, you know what, I, I can't do that? It's a hard question, Nick. I don't think I've ever thought about that. It's probably, it's probably disingenuous for me to think that I can really step back uh, to that time when when people really did feel like not keeping technologies moving forward uh, ahead of of Nazi Germany that the, the, and Japan that the world could change in a very negative way from which we would never recover. That, that sense of urgency is simply yeah. not here today. 
So it's easy looking back to, to, to second guess the people that are developing it, but as a developer, I tend to find that my job as a developer is to try to understand the policy implications of the things I'm building, especially things involving uh, artificial intelligence and autonomy right now, and to try to design into the system as many knobs as possible so that the use can be tailored in a way that, that, that mm -hmm. is most responsive to commander's intent, but policy intent. And so I tend to believe that if we can build it, we probably need to, because if we don't, someone else will. But that doesn't excuse us from understanding policy implications and trying as many ways as we can to give knobs to turn and dial depending on uh, national will and interest in using them. So let's take the nuclear bomb example and go one step further. What would be a knob? What's an example of a knob you could have built to then that could have changed the shape of the arms race? Yeah, I think nuclear weapons are, are always the thing that doesn't obey the set of rules. You either have them or you don't, and they're meant for, they're meant for large destruction. It's very, it's very important that we have them because you know, have, having them uh, you know, does prevent a deterrent from other people using it. You know, once, you're, once you're in the game, you have to be in the game. Um, but for conventional weapons and cyber weapons, I think they, they follow a different rule. And so the onus is, is on us to try to give as much flexibility in the use of those systems as possible. So tell me about the knobs in artificial intelligence, right? There are a lot of smart people, Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, who've warned us about the threat of a sentient AI and the threat it could, you know, existential threat it could cause to humanity in 20, 30 years. If there's anybody who's kind of helping it move forward, He's sitting here in this white chair. So what are the knobs you're, you're building to prevent the robots from coming in the back door? Yeah, I mean, it's, the important thing is to, have, is to have fences and gates as part of the architecture. So I'll give you an example. It's kind of an extreme example, but it may, it may be a different way of thinking about something that you're very familiar with, and that's your, that's your immune system. So your immune system is highly complex. Billions of different agents are part of it. And you have no illusion that you can control all of those agents, right? They're doing, their, they're doing their own thing. But when you go see a doctor, you do have an expectation that they, at a macro level, have a way of controlling this very complicated autonomous system. And that's the way medicine works. So, so I, we're trying to take that inspiration when we design systems, thinking, how do we make the operator, who's the doctor in this case, have control of complicated things at the bottom without having them control things at the cellular level. And you can do this by putting, by putting fences in the design. So software that says if the system crosses this path, boom, the system dies no matter, no matter what it's doing. If it crosses a geofence, it's done. You can take away the ability to write new, new code. So if you can't write new code, it's really hard to evolve. So, so we're thinking about it, and we see, we see opportunities to do it by designing appropriately um, in a way that doesn't preclude the use. Have you ever written, have you actually put out software that if it goes beyond a certain point, it will yeah, collapse? The, yeah, at the Perdix uh, swarm that we did out at China Lake, the swarm of 100, there is a, there's a fence that's there, and if Perdix cross the fence, they're done. And like specifically, what do you mean? So there's a geofence that's defined for the mission, mm -hmm. and so that's the fence that the operator defines as the place that you want to surveil, and then there's a fence that's slightly larger than that, which is the uh, permissive area of operation, and if any of the UAVs cross that outer fence, they die. Mm -hmm. So that's a way that you can prevent the system from going and doing something elsewhere where you don't intend it to be without having to be the quarterback inside the fence telling 100 different UAVs where they need to go in real time. Interesting. Question from the audience, which um, relates to a, a lot of what you do, which is thinking about where the next war will be and how we can fight it, is will there be war in space? It's a good, it's a good question. I mean, space is a highly lucrative target for an opponent to, to, to take on when facing the US, because what we, we did at the end of World War II in developing uh, the architecture that you eventually saw in the battlefield in Gulf War I was centralize a lot of functions in the military in space. So we needed to be able to beat a larger Russian force with a smaller conventional one. And so to do that, we needed to make every weapon count, so get uber precision in the architecture. The way we achieved uber precision was we said, well, we got to find a target. Well, I don't want to put that on the weapon because I'm going to lose it after I shoot it. So Let's put the finding of targets, uh, the imaging of them, let's put that in space. I need the weapon to navigate. Well, I could, I could put an expensive inertial unit 
on the weapon I'm building, but that jacks my cost up. So why don't I build a GPS system and use GPS, recycle it over and over again for every weapon, um, every weapon that, uh, that we see, uh, that we send on the battlefield. So, so that, that gave us the architecture we have today, which is, which is amazing, but it does make those space targets uh, lucrative. And so mm -hmm. we would be unwise to, to assume that space is this pristine domain in future. We need to be realist in thinking about 21st century war. But does that mean you're worried about somebody knocking out the GPS satellites, or does that make you worried that like, people are going to be launching offensive weapons into space? I think we have to worry about all of the above, Nick. I mean, the, the technology to, to go attack a satellite in space to do, you know, to do an ASAT uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a capability, we've seen countries do that. So we need to prepare uh, for, for a messy domain in space. And uh, that's one of, the, one of the things we spend a lot of time thinking about. No domains are going to be secure in future. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able, not be able to dominate, not be able to project power in them. But we've just been in a magic era in, in history where for 25 years, the world has known how the US military would go project power. Everyone has known. You've seen it. You know how we do it but the world could not stop it. We had such military dominance. But we're going back to where we've been for most of the history of warfare. Countries tend to have roughly the same capabilities. That doesn't mean they can use them the same way. That doesn't mean that, that they know all of the surprises that the other guy has in store for them. So we're moving back to a more historical norm where the creativity and the proficiency of the use of the systems, the ability to adapt to uncertainty is going to be, I think, the coin of the realm over technology that no one in the world can stop. And that's, a, that's an area where we have a huge advantage in the U.S. military. We have operators that are, uh, that are highly proficient, more proficient, more adept, more creative, more you fill in the superlative, I guarantee you it's true, than the rest of the world. And so as we move into this future war fighting, where the domains are blurred and no domains are, are out of bounds, where you're not just a unit, you're a team, but you're the quarterback of that team responsible for making complex decisions. And oh yeah, you're fighting in a massively networked world of information that you have to understand and respond to. The technology can get a lot of spotlights on it, but the human is gonna be the deciding factor in my opinion. So it goes back to why do we not wanna take people out of this? People are great at responding to the unknown. And right now, intelligent machines are not. So for the foreseeable future of warfare, it's going to be finding that right Frankensteining of the two where you dominate. People are also better at asking questions and upvoting them. And so the question that the audience wants to know is, the Iron Man suit, is it being developed? <laughs> Again, I hope the answer will be a simple yes. Ah, you know. <laughs> Again, something I would sign up to be the first person to use <laughs> if it were. You'd be shocked at how many people want the Iron Man suit. It's so awesome, right? And you can see that being like a huge delineator on the battlefield. It's, it's not something, I think eventually we'll, we'll have systems like that. It's really hard to do right now, folks, just because of the power that's required. You know, we need a new kind of power source than we can, can have today. I mean, and, and then you get into this, you get into this trade, which we've looked at, which is, for something that can generate a certain amount of power, how heavy is it? And there's just not a technology that gives you a lot of power but doesn't start jacking the weight of the system up so high that it effectively couldn't move. So I don't think you're going to see Iron Man uh, But that's soon. just a physics problem, right? You just need to be able to get more, more power into a smaller space. That's, that's why battery technology and any kind of energy technology is something we got to watch like a hawk in the Defense Department. We've talked about data, and that's really important, but, but energy is going to so be really, if I want an Iron Man suit, I just have to invent better batteries. Yeah, that, the little thing that, that Tony has in his chest that's uh -huh. basically a, nu a safe nuclear power plant that's the size of a small baseball, if you can build that for us, you will have a, you will have a very high ranking on our list of ideas. Well, I will, I, 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 hmm. <laughs> Don't anybody else take that idea, because... <laughs> Anyone in the over. audience have one, by the way? <laughs> if, if you do, please get a card from me before you leave today. Uh, I want to ask you a question from Fernando Romana, which actually gets at a really... Uh, hard issue sort of underlying a lot of this, which is if the drones are so smart, why do we get so many unwanted casualties? It kind of well, underlays a lot of what we've been talking about. Well, there's always, I mean, w war is hell, and that's never going to change, right? The, there will be mistakes, always. No matter, no matter how smart the machines are and how good the people are connected to them, 
when you're, when you're doing operations in real time with imperfect information, and information will always be imperfect, then mistakes will be made. And we should, we should, never, we should never accept a, a level of mistake and just say that's just the way it is. We should always try to push that lower and lower. Um, but, but war is an example of where the reality of technology and the reality of national security uh, don't you know, show that, that, that perfection in the way we project power isn't possible. So as a, as a designer, as a technologist, I'm looking for ways to push collateral damage and casualties down lower and lower. And by the way, one of the benefits of having, of having more autonomous systems teamed with human systems on the leading edge of the fight is that hopefully if we do it, do it right, uh, less people will, will die at, in, in warfare. The other side of that argument is what happens when warfare becomes more about machines fighting machines, and it's less of a big deal if you get into one. And so I don't think we'll see the pure machine-on-machine -machine army anytime soon or the machine-on-machine -machine navy anytime soon. But, but we are going to have to keep our eye on, not just as a developer like me, but as a society, as a country. You know, what do, how do we think about warfare when it's, when it's mainly autonomous robots that are, that are being destroyed? And does that make us have a greater proclivity for it? Uh, and, and if so, how, how can we change that? Because we should, never, we should never desire conflict. So part of the reason why things like SCO are public now is that we, we do not want to go to war. Uh, we, we have to be able to win one if we get in one. But our goal is to show that fighting the U.S. is just not a good idea. Let's take that back a little bit, because if we're sending our machines to fight somebody, fight somebody else's machines, of course war becomes more attractive, right? It becomes a lot easier to do. You worry less about collateral damage, and you worry a lot less about your machines getting killed than you do about your humans. So what do you do to not make us war hungry when that happens? It would be interesting to see how the world evolves, but you could see the, that, that there being such national prestige and and the fact that the military undergirds so much of national security, right? The policy, diplomacy, economics ride on the backbone of a, of a military that can back things up if things uh, don't go the way that we, that we need them to. That, that if a conflict occurred and a country that thought they had a cutting edge, mainly robotic military, was found out to have a military that could not cut it, or that had extreme vulnerabilities, I th they'd be highly disincentivized to have those aired in front of the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hoping that that dynamic That's will, interesting. Will, will, will pay out. But I think, we'll, my view, I think we will owe it to the American people to explain if, if someone you know, dies on day one, day two of the war, but we could have shifted around whatever they were doing so that an autonomous system could have taken on that responsibility, why didn't we do that? Why didn't we keep our people safe? So, It'll be a balance we'll have to watch, but um, you know it's it's still a step away, right? We're we're one step away from that future. South by Southwest told me that next year it will be all autonomous moderators, so this is my last chance to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the last question I'll ever ask, Will, is you've got uh, we got a minute and a half left. You've got a ton of smart people in the room. Give them your pitch to work with you and integrate with the Defense Department and play video games on your dime. One more time. I was actually reading this. But there's a question here. I do want to. I do. Oh, which answer. one? When I answer the black and gray? The... No, I do. I, I, All right. I think you ask a great. Okay, there's... here we go. Allison, you mentioned men in black and gray. What's the male-female ratio in SCO? Is it important for the strategies you develop to have balance? That is a great question. No, it's a great. Uh, so diverse team leads to diverse ideas, and so I, I'll have to think of the ratio. But I know that my deputy director, my director for analysis, one of my best program managers, and quite a few of the technical analysts are, are all female and some of the rock stars of the office. And the, the backgrounds, the technical disciplines that come in range from people that do energy to people that do chemistry, which are not you know, as common in the Defense Department. So I very, very much believe in the, in, the, in, the, in the mantra of diversity of people leads to diversity of ideas. And when you're in an office like SCO that has to think about the whole of future warfare, you cannot afford to have a blind spot in the, in the people that are generating ideas. All right. Um, this is Will Roper. Uh, until a year ago, he did not exist. We have a new Defense Department. He may get classified again. So I hope you enjoyed the uh, one hour where he was out in the sunlight. Um, thank you all for coming. This was an incredible panel. And thanks for your great questions. And uh, look forward to the future. Thanks, Will. <laughs>